So around a month ago, I sat down to watch a recently infamous video by the channel Illimation. I was only made aware of its existence after I saw an abundance of callout videos flood my recommended. To tell you the truth, I was immediately skeptical of the validity in these posts. They had a stench of fat phobia to them, we'll get to why that is in a second. Not to mention they all stem back to a well known right wing propagandist channel. This is all to say, I didn't know what to expect when I started watching Illimation's video. I obviously doubted the claims made from red pill adjacent channels, but was unsure on how well communicated their points would be. Questions that made it all the more comedic to find out the well crafted content that I was in for. Before we get to that, however, let me introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Think Before You Sleep, and as we're watching this video, he's going to call out any objections that he sees, and we're going to have a bit of a discussion about it. Psst, I warn you though, he's a bit of a talker. The video greets us with a recount of Alyssa's experience in high school. Our friend here has nothing to add to the conversation. Quiet as a mouse, and for good reason, it's purely anecdotal, beginning with a light-hearted recount of some experiences she had with bullies. I especially want to call attention to this little email exchange that she had with one of the girls picking on her. I hope there's no offense in saying that I got a light chuckle out of it, and that's kind of the point. It's a fun slice of life way to ground the video. Each plot point moving forward is made with the structure of this event in mind. It does this by making the storytelling very linear. You watch from the beginning, the point where Alyssa is quite literally a child, and view as that person grows older and changes, each time stumbling across some plot point that progresses the primary message of the video. For this reason, it's kind of disingenuous to take specific parts out and view them under a microscope. Tearing a leaf off a plant means that leaf is now dead, and this video is kind of the same. That being said, our friend here chooses to start his video four minutes into Alyssa's, where he reaches his first point, dietricians. So what did I do as a young girl who wasn't confident in her body? I started dieting at the age of 11. Now, was this diet recommended by my doctor? Did I check in with a certified dietitian on a monthly basis? Nope. So, wow, not a great plan. I know it sounds like a good idea, but generally doctors know nothing about proper nutrition because it's not a part of their training and dietitians tend to be all over the place with the quality of their advice. Uh Okay, so... Particularly as fat acceptance has creeped into the field. Anyway, Sleep Here flashes an article from Time magazine, where he highlights a quote from Dr. Lauren Lemieux. It relates to the thesis of the article, that current education for doctors doesn't fit the requirements we should be seeing within our society. Part of this critique actually falls on outdated beliefs regarding nutrition, as explained within the opening paragraph. Historically, nutrition education has been mostly rooted in biochemistry, pathology, and physiology with a nutrition focused content. Students then struggled to relate this to patient care. It's challenging to relate education hyper focused on nutrition to real life questions a patient may have about food. The article goes on to state that a progressive view of nutrition is in check. For example, an approach which blends nutrition with other components of a healthy life, like stress reduction, social support, and physical activity. This is not entirely a problem with doctors, however. The article concludes on a final statement called calling for a balance between educating doctors and understanding that much of this work is outsourced to dietitians. In fact, included within the very screenshot from Sleep's video, it questions how much training doctors truly require, instead opting for a multidisciplinary collaboration approach done to improve the workflow between doctors and registered dietitians. This ensures patients are provided with a maximal and recommended diagnosis of their condition and further treatments. Alyssa in her video takes the inclusive approach of including both a doctor and a nutritionist, which as explained again in Sleep's article typically results in a redirection to a nutritionist anyway. So Sleep, the research you brought to the table here agrees with Alyssa, because no, you're probably not smarter than a nutritionist, no matter what Sleep tells you. You're better off just doing your own research than to risk being paired with an activist dietitian who can burn years of your time, leading you down the wrong path. After condemning body positive dietitians, a position encouraged by the exact same article he just sourced, he shows Aubrey Gordon, a writer and advocate for the body positivity movement. And in a move made incredibly ironic, the same goddamn 10 minute read article from before provides further reading on weight bias in healthcare, which outsets with one of Aubrey Gordon's lines. Did you even read the article you were sourcing? Did you even even read the part that you put on screen? 
We're gonna keep watching, and next time, I expect you to read the entire source, all right? Unfortunately, this video is full of tabloid-style research and bad information that will lead people into an ideology that will cause them to be okay with being obese. For example, this moment here. According to the National Library of Medicine, about one half of teenage girls and one fourth of teenage boys have tried dieting to change the shape of their body. And of those girls, more than one out of three were actually at a healthy weight to begin with. And these numbers are wild to me. So my first question is, what's wrong with teens trying to lose weight? One in five people between the ages of two and 19 in America are obese, which means they should be concerned about their health. The second part of this statement says that 33% of teen girls who tried a diet were already at a healthy weight. What does a healthy weight mean? By some standards, I could be 40 pounds heavier than what people would describe as thin and still be at a healthy weight. These girls might have wanted to diet because they weren't thin, and wanting to be thin does not mean you desire to be underweight like the tone of this was suggesting. I think you're missing the point here, Sleep. See, the first fact was largely a setup, establishing the sheer scale of diet culture among teens. The real kicker comes from the second statistic, the worthlessness of it all. How much of it is necessary? It doesn't make any sense to argue the first fact by showing obesity statistics. It's like critiquing a joke when you haven't heard the punchline. Secondly, you dismiss the severity of the second statistic because of some arbitrary amount you estimate the scale of. Is dieting purely for bodily aesthetic reasons, not for health benefits? And how different really is that? We've established that these women are at a healthy rate. There is no necessity to alter their diet. Only the incredible subjective belief they're gonna come out as more attractive. Ask yourself, what is causing that motivation? If society is telling these women that the weight they are categorized as healthy is unattractive to the extent they wish to restrict their eating, all for the purpose to produce slimmer teenagers, that's not a good thing. You ask, what does a healthy weight mean? And my response, while screwed, is go ask your doctor. If you still believe in them anyway. Anything else you want to add about this little statistic here? So I looked up where Alyssa got the quote, to which she did not properly cite, so maybe this is the correct source? The first problem I see is that this is a sociological study from 20 years ago. Way too old. Studies like randomized surveys are out of date after five years because culture can change quickly. Okay, how the fuck does a conservative like you get off talking about cultural changes? But scientific evidence doesn't get made obsolete after a set time period, let alone one of only five years. It occurs when its research is supplemented by better research. Even if we were to say the study was outdated given its age, we would look towards how culture has changed, what transformation has occurred, and from my perspective, Position, it would only set to reinforce these results. Who gave you the authority to say where our culture has gone? And if she isn't gonna leave any links, what's your excuse? Why didn't you go looking for some newer publications? Stuff that would fit nice and tightly into your five year constraint. But to save you some trouble, here are some recent studies to show you the reliance of diet culture within teenage populations. So what you gotta say about that, huh? The second issue is that this page cites no sources, which means I don't know any of the specific definitions of the information here. So effectively, this is an opinion piece not scientific data. Seriously, fire the person who did this research. Teenagers should be focused on getting good grades, hanging out with their friends, and seeing the Timothy Chalamet Willy Wonka movie. Not counting calories. Ugh, I hate mathematics. Counting? <laughs> you gotta agree with this one, surely. I disagree. Oh. If they're obese, then they should be counting calories, learning how to eat healthier, and not buying movie snacks. Okay, but we've already established that they're not obese. A substantial volume of dieting teenagers were already at a healthy weight. Not to mention, counting calories is a very inefficient way of achieving weight loss. It's far more productive to approach weight loss from multiple perspectives. In examples when weight loss is necessary, and that does happen, it's often advised you seek medical advice to uncover your individual way of achieving that goal. Decreasing calorie count severely increases risk of your body reacting negatively, resulting in excessive fat storage as a defense mechanism. This creates the illusion of gaining weight when it's just your body's natural reaction. All of this is incredibly hard for any individual to deal with on their own, let alone a teenager with various other important responsibilities. Hence the message in Alyssa's video. It's also kind of disingenuous framing to show animations of teens who are a thin, attractive weight, and use that to suggest that kids who do have weight problems like obesity 
should be focusing on yet another low-risk, unoriginal Hollywood movie about a candy company instead of trying to fix their health issues. Though it's kind of ironic that a video about fat acceptance almost exclusively features thin people. Why did you choose to do that? Are you trying to erase fat people from existence? Put an anime parody of Choji here instead of Sasuke, or you're a bigot. Why are kids so body conscious? Why are they getting bullied? Who is teaching them this? Well, we all are, whether we realize it or not. It's called diet culture. We're all collectively responsible? Well, let's not play around with words here, sleep. We're talking about a socio-cultural issue. In other words, the culture we live amongst has set and enforced social standards. For example, diet culture. Whilst you and I exist in this culture, we are not directly responsible for these standards. This is the same for any social norm, like saying please and thank you. We didn't create this. You and I are not responsible for enforcing manners but we exist in a culture that has adopted this. Excuse me for being blunt, but if you're struggling to figure out what a social norm is, then you're hardly capable of housing a discussion on weight discrimination. First of all, you say that while showing a picture of a frappuccino, which is a fake coffee drink that was essentially created by Starbucks. No, wait. For all the people who don't know this because they can't cook, a vanilla frap at Starbucks literally has all the same ingredients as vanilla ice cream. To be clear, that's 50 grams of added sugar, which translates to 200 calories of processed sugar that was added to the drink. What are you There's talking nothing healthy about? about that, and I'm so glad that I'm not the only one who noticed that a frappuccino is essentially a dessert and not coffee, because it drives me insane to see people say that they're trying to lose weight followed by them starting their morning off by drinking a 380-calorie scoop of ice cream. She also wrote gluten-free on this animation. I hate to break it to you, but most of the Starbucks fraps are gluten-free. Gluten-free does not mean it will put you in a calorie deficit. Ice cream is gluten-free. Coca-Cola is gluten-free. Lay's potato chips are gluten-free. This is like claiming Oreos are healthy because they're vegan. Are people this easy to trick? It's a mockery of health advertising. It's meant to parody the shit you see from marketing companies. The language shown on the screen wasn't meant to be taken seriously. It's hyperbolic by design. It's a joke. And it accompanies Alyssa's explanation of marketing trying to sell us on the idea that we're the problem and the solution lies within their products. Look, she talks about it right after. Just watch this next part. According to self.com, diet culture is an entire belief system that associates food with morality and thinness with goodness. And it's rooted in the, very colonial, belief that every individual has full control and responsibility over their health. No, 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 that is woke propaganda. Oh god, please someone tell this girl that quoting a magazine article is not research. Stop acting like it is. You just did that earlier in the video. You quoted Time Magazine. Even worse, the full magazine actually disagreed with you. Maybe if you stopped being hypocritical for one second and actually read your source material, you wouldn't have made these shitty arguments. Also, the concept of diet culture didn't come from Self Magazine. It's an area of study. You can go and read papers on this, read books, watch a documentary. Just because a magazine said this doesn't make it obsolete. The line that Alyssa quoted from this article links to another article from self.com that is just a personal anecdote of a colleague of hers who goes by Aubrey Gordon. Aubrey Gordon, that name sounds familiar. Isn't that that woman who was cited in the magazine you showed? You know, the only source you provided so far that wasn't fucking Starbucks dietary information? It really is a small world, isn't it? But please continue. Then in Aubrey's article, she cites what looks like yet another opinion piece as proof of her arguments. Do any of these people use actual science to form their beliefs? Wait, did you just say what looks like yet another opinion piece? So you haven't read the paper? Do you need me to hold your hand and we go through it for you? All right, well, time to get up and move to the thinking table. Hello and welcome to The Thinking Table. Today we will be thinking about medicalization. Medicalization refers to the process of categorizing non-medical problems under medical concern, granting a medical solution to aspects of human life that otherwise wouldn't necessitate medical interjection. It is a sociological term that relates to deviance, and I'll tell you why that is. When we view abnormalities in a medical sense, we view them as exactly that, the objection from the norm. 
the deviant. Medicalization describes assigning deviancy as medically treatable, failing to consider the non-medical causes of these abnormalities. Examples of medicalized conditions could be menopausal women, categorizing appearances of menopause under illnesses, ones that can be treated via hormone therapy, antidepressants, and lifestyle changes. Further examples that extend away from women's bodies could be autism. A belief that is beginning to escape the medicalized phase is the treatment of autism as curable, that medical intervention can normalize this deviancy, the operative word being normalized, the practice is socially influenced. These restraints can be conducive to more menial attributes, say low testosterone, bad breath, and even body weight. Medicalized terminology such as obesity, overweight, and obesity epidemic refer to medical descriptors of a fat individual. The consequence of the scientific perspective is treating the patient as though they are diseased. Labeling this person's body as deviant, wrong, against a societal norm. And in response, we must attempt to normalize them, bring them back to society's expectations. The historic way of doing this was to place responsibility on the individual. It's through medicine that we get phrases such as calories in, calories out. On a mathematical standpoint, this phrase makes sense. However, strictly using the biological perspective ignores any environmental factors that go into obesity. The medical model has a tendency towards ignoring the social influences of a medicalized problem. It has been long criticized for its scientific reductionism and theoretical individualism, meaning it is both ignoring a large area of study and and enforcing scrutiny upon the individual. When issues like obesity are medicalized, they are framed as being primarily private and personal. This ignores the reality that social factors like class and inequality share a positive correlation with the prevalence of obesity. The argument against medicalization suggests that the obesity epidemic as it has come to be known is best suited as a social problem rather than a medical one. Our biological perspective has proven inefficient. No single country has succeeded in reducing its obesity rate over the past 41 years. Despite absorbent amounts of government funding, there has been little progress towards preventing the obesity epidemic. Sleep when referring to the radical body positivity left is simply talking about the way society has been moving for decades towards what is known as the obesogenic environment, a society that considers environmental factors without being reliant on weight loss. Because because regardless of treatment, our current way of categorizing fatness is constructed by the clinical definition of obesity, which unfortunately doesn't correlate with a lot of our understanding. Our tactics of defining obesity are unsubstantiated. They do not provide substantial evidence that we know what's normal from what is wrong. The model for defining obesity is unstable and unpredictable. It is simply not reliable at defining what obesity actually is. Often still, metrics tricks such as BMI are occasionally orchestrated as scientifically based fact. This has the potential to exacerbate prejudice within society. In general, the anti-medicalization perspective exists to provide critique towards inappropriate categorization of obesity, questioning how much role the biological perspective has in defining its validity. Stating that an uncontested medicalized definition is inevitably infested with cultural and political narratives. You used to legitimize potentially oppressive and discriminatory clinical customs and procedures, the most prevalent of which being against women's bodies. Biomedical discourse is considerably gendered. Documentation on how we depict body weight and size often targets the female body, consequently resulting in women being depicted as undesirable and unattractive, needing to be shaped and altered. Often our ways of categorizing fatness are dependent on the average. What should a normalized human look like. This view has grown outdated, with much of what we know now about health being individualized. So we are using our unreliable methods of identifying obesity to assign medical treatments of dietary restrictions and even surgery to regulate issues that we cannot describe. Fat studies has come a long way, growing into an entire academic field. It would simply be impossible for me to understand the entire concept and convey it in a short video segment. 
so I encourage you to read a few very passionate papers listed down below. Some of them are surprisingly moving, written by some incredibly well-spoken individuals. Allow me to read a segment from a research article published by an associate professor at the University of Iceland. I have in this discussion underlined the blindness of medicine towards the humanity of those being fat. The core of medicine concerns people and how to make their lives better. Hence medicine is not primarily about objective science, it is a profession with a rich ethical dimension. That is why medicine needs to take this criticism seriously. They need to realise the missing factor in the medical discourse. They need to include the humanity of fat people. This is the concept that is addressed in Robert Crawford's article. You may recognise this as the article featured in Sleep's video, and the introduction of a new term, healthyism. Healthyism is rather a study of the individual's reaction within a medicalised world. What you must understand is this paper was published in 1980, following a decade of considerable interest in health consciousness. All at once the world brought personal health concerns into what was essentially a side hobby, fed through mass media and aggressive health campaigns. Thus, an emergence of body conscious paranoia was inevitable. Obsession over healthy intake and healthy behaviours. Equating body weight to worthiness are all examples of a healthyism mindset. A mindset which constructs hierarchies based on everyone's perceived health consciousness. Deeming moral value on the perceived health consciousness of others. Placing health at the pinnacle of human achievement. If you are not healthy, there is something abhuman in you. If you are not healthy, then you are subhuman to me. This article suggests that health mustn't be treated as the utopia of human achievement, the end all of human misery. Again, unlike sleep would like you to believe, this is not to discourage healthy behaviour. I and the rest of this debate is not encouraging you to be unhealthy. Instead we want to remove the correlation of health with self-worth, treating healthy behaviour as the paradigm for good living. Healthyism is rather an area of critique used to expose contradictions in the medical industry. It is not meant to destroy the medical industry and should not be considered as such. Unfortunately, confusing the idea of medicalised obesity as a black and white problem is repeatedly performed by one-dimensional thinkers. All of these theories are not meant to be taken in full but consumed simultaneously. This is a sociological issue. If there were one explanation for human behaviour, we would be gods by now. And to quote from Crawford, Crawford himself, various health movements have taken vastly different directions. Political activists in the occupational and environmental health movements are most often singular in their focus on factors external to the individual objective factors, like the corporate production of carcinogens that pose concrete health threats, while healthiest and holistic health and self-care movements are preoccupied with the subjective, behavioural arena. Both take fundamental truths and turn them into half-truths for an exclusive attention. One takes the individual as the problem, the other takes the society as the problem. Both fail to understand what Marx understood. Calm down sleep. Above all, we must avoid postulating society, again, as an abstraction vis-a-vis -vis the individual. The individual is the social being. The work that Crawford presented within his article would go on to become highly influential in the medical field, to be the catalyst of further research and education through his introduction of the term he coined, healthyism. An era of study which would only become more important in the aftermath of his publication, as this article even predates the AIDS crisis. This article predates the obesity epidemic. This article and its understanding of a health-centric world would only become more authentic with time. Stripping this back further, we can pull up the self.com article cited in Sleep's video. You may notice a certain definition reminiscent in the title. We have to stop thinking of being healthy as being morally better. As suggested by the the title and explicit in its subheading, this article is centred around healthyism, providing a personal perspective then transitioning into a more general definition, much in the same way that I've been doing now. Although from a more authentic perspective as I am clearly not speaking from a fat body, Sleep generalises the entire article as being a personal anecdote, which is so willfully ignorant it hurts. You can clearly see on the screen that the article is explaining a term that's not a personal anecdote 
don't sleep. That's fucking education. The dictionary is not a recount, and that is the problem underpinning the entirety of Sleep's video. A vast amount of the things Sleep says can be traced back to the conclusion that he just does not comprehend the words I am saying. And right before refusing to do a little silent reading like a little kid, he says this. Or maybe give some advice on how to eat healthy? Nope, she just says you're a racist if you think being thin is good. Oh no, not again. The word in this sentence, goodness, is not related to whether it is healthy or not. It is good in the sense of self-worth. Am I good enough, not is this act good? It comes from the primary critique of healthyism, relating healthy eating to self-worth. Furthermore, the simple factor of having something be rooted in colonial history does not make us racist. No one is claiming that you are a racist and partaking in healthyism. The definition is supposed to be universal and unescaping in the modern era. Plenty of behaviours that we take for granted were structured on bigoted ideology. You don't hate poor people if you cringe every time you hear a swear word. You're not Christian if you're falling for an unstable work ethic. These terms are simply derived from those places, not indicative of the person partaking in them. Now whilst on one hand I want to continue going through Sleep's video and dissecting all the ways that he embarrasses himself, let me ask you a question. What would even be the point of doing that? If he's just going to trip over the same ideas time and time again, we're not going to get anywhere. This is the result when you strip a conversation of all its messaging. Any context which applies one side gets thrown out for no better reason than to support the opposing narrative. A video enters with a strong and thought-provoking message, and returns as a product of controversy, a product used to springboard into insulting Alyssa's appearance, going as far to include scouring her social media pages to annotate the face or feature features that need improving. Those aren't my words by the way, Alyssa is very pretty. And apart from that, I have nothing else to add to this video. And frankly, neither does Sleep. To continue his point, he needs to make broad assumptions or even manipulate clips. There is no talking points left, it's just lies. So, where does that leave us? Well, certainly not nowhere. Fat studies is a far more broad movement than what is contained within some YouTube video. Far more than I can tell you, and far more than I know myself. There's so much out there waiting for you to learn. It can be very challenging to conceptualize your own weight, your health and everything that it means. But that world isn't going to change by convincing some random conservative on the internet. That change comes from you. You're who's important here. So take care of yourself. I'm going to run for a few different sources for you to check out in a few different mediums. To begin, I'd be remiss not to mention Aubrey Gordon or her podcast Maintenance Phase. Together with journalist Michael Hobbs, the two debunk and decode wellness and weight loss trends. You can also download her audiobooks through the link in the description. I haven't read either of them yet, but I'm interested to check them out someday. I think I'd start with her book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, but I encourage you to beat me to it. As you would expect, the papers featured in the video will be available through the description as well. Not only do I encourage reading those, but diving into their sources and learning how the full study connects. Let me know how long it takes you to get to Michel Foucault. I purposely avoided that topic, but believe me, comparing fat studies to the Panopticon was unbelievably tempting. Studies aside, I'm partially ignoring the wider context of this story. Regardless of what science says, regardless of what's said in research papers, just don't make fun of people. It's that simple. We don't need a facet of science to say belittling people is wrong, because all that comes with that is this debate. Sleep says some point from a medical perspective, I give a humanitarian rebuttal, and we trade comments back and forth until the end of time. That is because the structure of our conversation is unstable. We cannot progress with a healthy debate until establishing the basic idea that making fun of people is wrong. I believe continuing to have this debate is concealing the truth of the matter. Fat people need a system that appreciates them, and we shouldn't hide behind smart comments backs to avoid the very simple answer of empathy. That's about all I have to say on the topic. Tell me what you think about the video and maybe I'll return to it someday. With that being said, I'll see you losers next time. Peace. Do you think in the Truman Show they would have had a pride parade? Or was that too like controversial for the TV show? If anyone says I look like Big Joel in this video because of this jacket, I will find you. I uh, will... You know, probably do nothing about it. I've got sweaters too, you know. He's not the only one with sweaters. He might have some of the best sweaters in the game, but it doesn't make him superior to you and I. You know, I think everyone deserves 
one nice sweater, you know? And Big Joel, he's got a capital on the sweater market. He's got a big capital for a Big Joel on the sweater game. You know, and if he, if he was a, um, I don't know what his political opinions are, if he's a communist, <laughs> I'm going to get him. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm just, just kidding. Uh, but you better share that sort of stuff around, you know, if he's, if he's cool like that. Hey big, <laughs> hey, big Joel, if you come over to New Zealand, he's not going to... What am I... Uh, how fucking up my own ass am I? He's not going to see this video. <laughs> oh!